Hello, I'm Nancy Guthrie, and I'm so excited to be with you to dive into the book of Nehemiah as we look together in this session at chapters one and two. The book of Nehemiah opens by telling us the who, what, where, and when of what we're about to read. Look with me in verse one. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel. So the who is Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a Jew living far away from Jerusalem. In fact, he's probably never seen Jerusalem. His great grandparents, who likely lived in the generation of prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel, they knew it well. But long before Nehemiah was born, they saw the armies of Babylon march into Jerusalem and they were taken into exile into Babylon. Then in his grandparents' generation, the Persian Empire took over the reins of power from the Babylonians. And when their king, Cyrus, announced that all of the Jews who were scattered throughout the empire were free to go home to Jerusalem, Nehemiah's grandparents and parents likely waved goodbye to friends and family who were headed back to Jerusalem to resettle and rebuild the temple under Zerubbabel. Thirteen years before what we're about to read in Nehemiah, there were more goodbyes, as Ezra took a group made up mostly of Levites to reestablish worship in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. We learn at the end of chapter one why Nehemiah himself did not go. He says in the last verse, now I was a cupbearer to the king. So this helps us to understand the where and the when that we've just read about in the first verse. Nehemiah is in Susa, the summer palace of the king of Persia, where he serves in the trusted position of wine taster, confidant, and companion to the king. And it's the 20th year of the reign of this king, Artaxerxes. The next verse, verse two, tells us the what. What happened to Nehemiah as he was serving the king in Susa in about 445 BC? He writes in verse two, Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. It's clear that even though Nehemiah is far away from Jerusalem, his heart is there with the people who are there. Clearly he's been brought up in the home of a part of the faithful remnant living in exile. He knows about Yahweh and Yahweh's covenant promises to his people. He knows that Jerusalem is the city at the center of God's saving purposes in the world the city to which God himself descended to dwell in the temple among his people. God had promised to bring his people home to this city. But the reality is that God's people are, according to verse three, in great trouble and shame. What is the great trouble and shame? The wall is broken down and its gates destroyed by fire. So there's no security in the city, no commercial development. Even though people have been free to return, homes are not being rebuilt there. The broken down wall served as a shameful reminder that God had fulfilled the covenant curses because of his people's sins. Nehemiah knows that ever since God brought his people Israel out of Egypt so that they could worship him, and ever since he descended to dwell in the temple in Jerusalem, God has intended for his people to live in his land and worship him as those who love the Lord with all of their heart, soul, and might. They were supposed to be a kingdom of priests, a living demonstration of Yahweh's goodness and glory in the world, a declaration of his salvation to the world. But at this point, Jerusalem seems to be declaring that there is nothing to be gained in worshiping the one true God, that his promises have not proved true. Nehemiah's heart is broken by the things that break the heart of God. 
which really is the mark of someone who truly knows and loves God. His heart is broken, but he knows what to do. He knows where to go with his broken heart. He turns to the one person who loves his people more than he does. The one person who is more committed to the future of Jerusalem than he is. The one person who has the power to deal with the great trouble and shame of his people. He begins to pray to his God and he keeps praying. Nehemiah is clear on who he is praying to. Look with me in verse five, where we see that he asks the great and awesome God to deal with the great trouble. This isn't just any God. This is the God who, according to verse five, keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. This is the God, according to verse 10, who redeemed his people by his great power and by his strong hand. Nehemiah is praying about his people to a God who has a long history of protecting and providing for his people. Nehemiah is also clear on who God's people are. They are people with whom he has made a covenant, people who have sinned against him. Though God has loved them with a steadfast love, they have failed to love and obey him. But Nehemiah is not merely pointing his finger at them as he confesses on behalf of his people. He counts himself and his family among them. He says at the end of verse six, even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Nehemiah is not coming to God suggesting that his people deserve for God to do something about their great trouble and shame. He's asking God to give them what they do not deserve. You see, that's grace, getting what we don't deserve. Nehemiah is asking God to act in grace toward his people. He's asking God to do what he promised to do, reminding God of his promise that he made so long before. He says in verse eight when he prays, Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. Nehemiah is showing you and me how to pray. You see, prayer isn't coming up with our list of what we think God ought to do and putting the pressure on him to do it. Prayer is asking God to do what he has promised to do, asking him to be true to his word, which he always is. Through Moses and the prophets, God promised that he would scatter his people when they were unfaithful to him. And God has kept that difficult promise. But God also promised that when his people repented, he would gather them and bring them back to the land he had given to them, back to himself. So Nehemiah is praying, asking God to do what he said he would do, asking him to gather his people to Jerusalem and make it a place where God would dwell with his people in such a way that would demonstrate and declare his goodness and glory to the nations. Nehemiah ended his prayer asking God to give him success in seeking permission and help from the king to be a part of rebuilding the walls in Jerusalem. As a trusted servant of King Artaxerxes, Nehemiah would have been well aware of an earlier attempt to rebuild Jerusalem's walls that had been reported to the king as rebellion and that on his orders, work on the walls had been brought to an abrupt stop. But he also knew from the Proverbs that the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. So he asked God to turn King Artaxerxes' heart toward granting his request. And that's exactly what God did. Nehemiah told the king how long he would be gone and asked him for protection from potential enemies as well as resources for the rebuilding. Look in verse eight in chapter two, he says, and the king granted me what I asked. 
for the good hand of my God was upon me. Nehemiah knew it wasn't his brilliant tactics or winning personality that caused the king to say yes, but that the good hand of his great God was at work for his people who were in great trouble. God was showing grace to his people who were in disgrace. When Nehemiah got to Jerusalem, he surveyed the city by the light of the moon, finding giant stones that had once been embedded in the city's great wall, laying half buried, embedded in the earth. He looked at the ruined stones and he saw them as a picture of the people of God, broken down, ruined, needing to be renewed, reclaimed, restored. So he gathered the people together and we read that he says to them in chapter two, verse 17, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. Nehemiah has been there only three days and yet he speaks as one with God's people about the trouble we are in, inviting them to join him in building the wall, assuring them of God's divine guidance and provision in the work. In verse 18, we read that he says, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. The people in great trouble began to get everything ready for doing the good work so that the name of their great God would be given the honor he is due in the world. But not everyone was excited about the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Nehemiah records in verse 19 that when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Throughout the Bible, ever since God promised that the offspring of the serpent would be at enmity with the seed of the woman, we've witnessed the enemies of God and God's people despise and seek to defeat the building of the kingdom of God. And here we see it again. But Nehemiah knows that every time the seed of the serpent has sought to defeat the seed of the woman, God's people have prevailed. Nothing and no one can defeat the purposes God has for his people, his church. And at this point in history, God's purpose for his people is for them to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So Nehemiah replied to those opposing him in verse 20. He says, the God of heaven will make us prosper and we his servants will arise and build but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. Nehemiah made it clear that the work of building the walls was not generated from a human scheme. It wasn't dependent upon human ability and it wasn't vulnerable to human opposition. Nehemiah was building the physical kingdom of God in his day. It's a picture for us of the kingdom God is building in our day, his church. We as living stones are being built into a holy community on our cornerstone, Jesus Christ. There's plenty of opposition in this world that we may think at times presents a real threat to the church, but let's allow Nehemiah's confidence in God to become our confidence as we labor to proclaim the Lord's name in the midst of a hostile environment as we seek to be part of what God is doing through his church in our generation. With Nehemiah, let's say, the God of heaven will make us prosper and we his servants will arise and build.